Kyle Eschenroder, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again, Brett. This is I'm uh, excited to be here. So yeah, the last time we had you on, we, we were talking about taking action, the philosophy of taking action. And uh, we partnered with you and published a book called The Pocket Guide to Action, which I know a lot of people have bought and really enjoyed and got something out of it. We're actually coming out with another little publication of yours, The Man's Guide to Self-Reliance. It's a little booklet that you can fit in the back of your pocket. And it's based on an article that you wrote, I guess it was last year, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's called The Man's Guide to Self-Reliance. So let's start with self-reliance is something that gets thrown around a lot. People, you know, they quote the Emerson essay and sort of use it as a as a manifesto of being independent and being uh, thinking different and all that, whatever, you know, motivational stuff you you see. <laughs> what do you think most people get wrong about self-reliance or the self-reliance that you're talking about in, in this little book? Yeah, I think, I think the fundamental thing that, that people miss when talking about self-reliance is, is kind of conflating self-reliance and self-centeredness. And it's not that at all, in, in my view. And I think also people come at it from a, a more you know, f- physical point of view than anything. So it's about you know, being completely you know, b- being off the grid or you know, having a beard and, and growing your own food and, or just doing kind of eccentric things in, in the world. So, you know, it's also easy to read, you know, the, his essay as a manifesto for narcissism or a total dismissal of tradition, propriety, and, and kind of puts you against society in general. And it's, I think, you know, I made a lot of those mistakes in some of my early readings of his essay. And I've been reading at least, you know, once a year for over a decade now. So every time, you know, get something more out of it, I think I understand something a little bit more thoroughly. And, you know, some of it, so it's also easy to read it as a call to do something huge and and remake the entire world. Because there's a lot of quotes in there, like he talks about, like, you know, who would teach Shakespeare, Shakespeare, you know, and, and, you know, quotes about achieving greatness in general. But fundamentally, the essay, its most important parts are about asking us to live our lives from our center and to actually pay pay closer attention to what's inside us, outside of us, but in general, just kind of come at the world from a deeper self-trust. And that doesn't necessitate doing anything crazy, breaking society, you know, denting the universe or, or anything like that. Yeah, I think it's interesting how I know a lot of people when they were teenagers, like that's probably the first time they read Emerson's self-reliance and they think like, oh my gosh, this is, this is speaking to me. Right. And then like, because you're a teenager and you're dumb, you you kind of read it with that sort of self-centered, I'm going to be a rebel and different, whatever mentality when you you completely miss the point of it. And then as you get older and you read it again, you're like, oh, okay, that's what he, that's what he was actually talking about. Exactly. And you know, I actually recently read one of his, his essays, it's an essay on manners, which is all about propriety. And, and, and you see him balance these ideas of, yes, you know, you can get a, away with a lot in society. If, if you're being self-reliant, if you're acting from your center, you will get away with a lot of eccentricities. But, you know, the, the crowd is only going to put up with you being so loud about such and such things. And it's not, you know, it's not an expression of self just, to kind of be to be loud and, and obnoxious. That's that's not the point. The point is, you know, uh, exploring those boundaries and trusting yourself. But yeah, like like you said, it's not <laughs> it's not about becoming a narcissist. Yeah. Well, and, and another transcendentalist, you know, the guy who had is Thoreau, right? These are contemporary contemporary of Emerson. And that idea of like being self reliant doesn't mean you have to do something huge, right, and something grand. Thoreau obviously did, you know, we were still talking about his work today, but I think what's interesting about him with his trajectory, his, of his, of his career, when he was young, when he was a young man, he had this ambition to go to New York and just make a splash in the literary scene. He wanted to be a big name there. And he, he went out there and he failed completely trying to write this, you know, the great, whatever American novel or whatever. So he goes back and he goes to Walden Pond 
And he just writes about nature and some other thoughts. And like that little thing, like he wasn't even trying to like be huge and big and important. That little thing, that's the thing that made him huge and big and important was when he started just just following that, you know, following his bliss, whatever it is you want to say. Yes, I think that's that's awesome. That's that's a, a perfect example of of self reliance, and I think you know a, another aspect of that too that that I think you know people put so much emphasis on self reliance and you know finances or or being self contained, taking no help at all. Of course, while Thoreau was writing on Walden Pond, it, it was you know on land owned by Emerson, right? So he was getting help to follow that inclination. So, okay, we talked about what self-reliance is, and it's not self-centered. It's maturity. It's an understanding. It's just looking at within and following that, that voice inside of you doesn't mean you're necessarily going to make a huge dent in the world. But let's, let's kind of get a positive definition of self-reliance. So how, what are some of the attributes of self-reliance that you think are really capture uh, when, you, when Emerson was talking about self-reliance? Yeah, these things are so hard to define, and and I think we you know spend a lot of this little booklet, you know, trying to get at what it is and what it's not. So it's one of these ideas you can point at from a bunch of different ways, but it's tough to kind of wrap up in something tidy. But if I'm going to try to do that, I would say you know something like maintaining sovereignty over the self in a connected, civilized world, and I think that that points to the importance about you know, being interdirected in such a way that your decisions and opinions are defined primarily by your own experience of the world. Yeah, so so I think that that kind of sums it up, maintaining sovereignty over the self in a connected, civilized world. And so what, as you've come up with this idea and as you flesh this idea out in your booklet, who are some of the thinkers that have informed that idea or your fleshed out idea of that definition you just gave? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think Emerson is, you know, of course, he's the guy that gave it a name. He he made the idea click. And for a long time, that essay on self-reliance kind of served as close to a religious text for me. But the Stoics, especially Seneca, have helped inform at least my conception of self-reliance, especially in the way they use reasoning to to see things more clearly. I think Nassim Taleb is is you know the modern thinker who's who's informed my idea of self-reliance the most, and it's partly because of his ideas, but mostly just because the posture he takes in the world. He's willing to you know say anything, piss off anybody. So I think you know to some degree he he represents a certain mode of self-reliance. And then there's an Indian sage, Krishnamurti who really informed the experiential side of how I see self-reliance. And, you know, he just does such a great job at talking about direct experience and making it clear how, how much learning happens in a direct experience that is impossible through secondary experience, through hearing other people talk about what they're seeing and, or what they've done, you know, and, and, and really focusing on all the learning that you, that can happen from your direct experience. And the person who's changed my idea of self-reliance the most recently has been Milton Mayeroff, who is the author of this little book called On Caring. It's a short book and, and really incredible. And he, he has some really potent ideas about becoming yourself through serving something else that really helps cut out that narcissistic possibility or, or potential reading of, of self-reliance and his ideas on, you know, becoming more of yourself through serving another more intensely really kind of made a bunch of sections of Emerson's essay pop that I kind of ignored before because maybe I just didn't really get them. And I hate to talk about it in such vague terms right now, but we'll touch on those later, I'm sure. But so it's also self-reliance has been one of those central ideas that, you know, hit me early as a teen, like you were talking about. And so it became this kind of vortex. So everything that I'm reading, like, brings itself to self-reliance in, in one way or another. And so now I have in my commonplace book where I kind of collect 
ideas. I have this huge section on self-reliance and, and things that point to it in different ways. And yeah, we'll, we'll get to a distillation of a bunch of those in the next next few minutes, I'm sure. Sure. And do you think this, I, this type of self-reliance that you're talking about, is it hard to develop? And if so, why? Yes. I think it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. You know, we have interdependent relationships with everything, especially the people in our life. So, and, you know, extension of that, you know, society, I think, you know, self-reliance is an internal thing. So it's hard to create objective feedback loops that we would normally use to develop skills and and it's contextual so even when we're talking about it when we try to define something it's it's very difficult because it's a it's a posture more than anything so you know we can't define a set of things to do and then if you do those things that means you're self-reliant right because if you're following something blindly and you know following it doesn't matter how physically independent you are from the world that doesn't mean that you're you're have a self-reliant posture and beyond that it's just it's 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 a constant practice the default is to be pulled off center and it just takes a a lot of effort and attention to remain self-reliant so let's talk about some of these like specifics that you can like practices meditations that you can take or do mm-hmm. to develop self-reliance so you talk off you start off talking about solitude what role does solitude play in developing self-reliance and what kind of solitude are we talking about here yeah i think part of it's you know solitude we're talking about it in a physical and mental and i think solitude allows you to get in touch with your inner voice that can get drowned out in day-to-day life. And of course, that only happens if you're using solitude in a proper way, right? So that's, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're spending your time, you know, by yourself, but then you're consuming random content or, or playing video games, you're, you know, that's not getting you in touch with what you think and what you believe. That's just just outside distractions creep, creeping into your physical solitude. So it's still kind of mental chaos. So, you know, I would define, you know, solitude, physical and mental solitude is an area in which you're able to be physically alone, but also be alone with your thoughts. So you can actually witness what you think, what you believe, and see how you're considering things in life. Gotcha. And so how do you go about, I mean, because like secluding yourself digitally is hard, right? Because if you have a phone, you might work on your computer. So what are some things that you do to digitally seclude yourself? Yeah. So, so that's, that's the tough one, right? Digital seclusion. I think airplane mode is our friend on our phones. You know, having periods of, of being unplugged is really helpful. And these are, you know, not novel solutions. You know, one of the first things I recommended on the first article you all ever published from me at, at Art of Manliness was an input deprivation week. So that's basically removing yourself from any content consumption for a week, deleting all content, apps on your phone, games, or anything else that might be somewhere where you consume content. So that means no movies, no TV, no books, no inputs at all. Ideally, not even music. So it forces you into noticing your inclinations to consume. And instead, you spend those times journaling, doodling, creating, working on something, talking with people, you know, and a ton of people have responded to that, had absolutely incredible results. I've been blown away, you know, so, so that's kind of the extreme, but you can do that to different degrees every day. So maybe you have an hour a day where you're journaling or you have an hour a day where you're going on a walk with no podcast or no, you know, no, no kind of distraction where you're just there. And, you know, the idea behind this type of solitude isn't that content consumption is bad at all. It's, it's not in, in most professions rely on it. I think, you know, content consumption can help creativity, productivity, and, you know, general progress in life. But the point is to separate from that and get familiar with yourself, your inclinations, your style, your capabilities outside of, of this constant stream of distractions. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, th- that way of creating digital solitude is similar you know, to what we're trying to achieve in, in moments of solitude physically from other people in general too. So you know, it's not that society is evil and that you should become a hermit. That's like a really bad idea. The point is that it's important to be able to retreat from society so that you can get back in touch with what you 
think, want, feel, etc. Yeah, I just, it's kind of related. I just saw this thing on the line this week where this travel photographer put together a collage of all the travel photos on Instagram and they've all, they all look the same. And <laughs> like there are certain motifs like that, you know, the one, like the hand. So like, there's like the girl in front and like the guy holding the hand, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm, like that's become, mm-hmm. a, that's become like everyone does oh, that yeah. or like, and I, I think that the point goes that that's what happens whenever you don't make time for seclusion, you just end up doing and mimicking what you see other people do instead of trying something new when you're alone, because you don't care, right? Like it's, it's for you. And, but that thing, but that thing you might come up with by yourself might be the stroke of genius, but you never know that unless you kind of disconnect yourself from what, what's going on around you. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. When, when you're planning trips around, you know, the goal of having a certain Instagram photo, you're, you're not going to have the time or room for, for, yeah, that, that more quiet, desire that's more true to you to go off and and do the thing that could actually make an interesting impact in your life. So another sort of tactic or practice that you advocate for in becoming more self-reliant is developing your your inner scorecard. What's that and how does that help you become more self-reliant? Yeah, so this is this is an idea from Warren Buffett and your inner scorecard that's you know you can call it a yardstick that you use to judge yourself. And it's created by you for you. And it's, you know, you can contrast it with an outer scorecard, which is basically what other people think of you. So if you're using an outer scorecard, you're judging yourself based on reactions you're getting from random people around you. And if you're making decisions based on the outer scorecard, then, you know, it's almost impossible to make a contrarian decision, right? Right which means it'll be just about impossible to realize incredible returns, whether it's, you know, an investment idea or an idea for a business or anything else. It's going to, you know, it's going to be difficult to break out and it's going to be difficult to stay sane because the world is really fickle in how they judge you. And if, if you're relying on them for kind of guidance on, on what to do next and, and how, how to think about yourself, you're going to be end up just really confused and kind of in a bad place. So, but if you stick to your inner scorecard, you'll be able to reliably make better decisions and handle the ups and downs that come with those decisions more easily because you know that you're following this, the rules you set for yourself. And it, it gives you some reliable standard to judge yourself by. I, I kind of see it as a tool to to go with the saying, don't care what other people think. And that's not to be taken, you know, all the way. So <laughs> I came across a really interesting Warren Buffett quote the other day. He said, someone asked him why he loved going to work every morning. And he said, because I get to paint my own painting and I like the applause. And so <laughs> that, that brings up kind of a difficult question, which is, you know, can we care about what other people think, you know, and, and still remain self-reliant. And I, I think that we can, as long as we, you know, maintain our dedication to the internal scorecard, that we select the people whose opinions we care about, at least somewhat carefully, and make sure that, you know, make, make sure that we know when they're wrong, right? So having an inner scorecard can help you determine whether or not the applause or booing you're getting from the crowd is, is valid, and, and just to be conscious in general that somebody else's opinion is driving us and to what degree. I, I think that there's a, a balance to be had there. So using the internal scorecard is kind of the primary thing without pretending that nobody's opinion matters to you, which I think is impossible in a world as you know, interconnected as ours and as a, as a member of a species who's so like thoroughly social. So in the, the inner scorecard doesn't also comes in handy for, you know, not just for opinions, but also just outcomes you have no control over, right? If you're an entrepreneur or even like a coach, I know a lot of sports coaches kind of had this idea of the inner scorecard, you know, Bill Walsh has that book, the score takes care of itself. John Wooden had something and their whole thing was like, doesn't matter what the score is on the, the board. As long as we hit these internal metrics mm-hmm. that we have for ourselves. That was the success. That's all you can do. And sometimes there's nothing else you can do besides that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And some, and sometimes, you know, th- there's, there's things that are outside of your control, you know? So, 
you know, they, they know that focusing on those metrics are going to give them the best chance at a favorable outcome, right? So the score takes care of itself after you focus on these things. But you're not focusing on, on the ultimate score. You're focusing on, you know, each play. And you know, he goes through the whole book. But you know, you, you, you're, yeah, exactly. You're, you're focusing on your internal scorecard that is designed to create the best possible outcome, even if those outcomes are kind of, either, they can be, you know, lumpy returns or, or just, you know, uh, there's, there's always probability that plays a role. So you do your best and sometimes you don't lose, but like you said, if you stay true to those internal metrics, you're, you're still one. And that, that kind of leads to the next point you talk about in the book is, you know, self-reliant people ignore probabilities. Why should self-reliant people ignore probabilities? I think, you know, it, 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 so I, I think I should preface this by saying that we shouldn't ignore all probabilities in general. But I think the self-reliant person is going to ignore probabilities about the chances of accomplishing what they want to accomplish. So there's a few reasons for this. First, you know, Peter Thiel said, you are not a lottery ticket, a famous investor. And I think that that's, you know, you are not a lottery ticket. So any set of statistics inherently ignores huge factors that will actually determine your chance at success. So they don't take into account things like your experience, your network, your team, resources, your talent, your grit, ingenuity, commitment, all sorts of things. It, you know, these are massive indicators of success and any measurement is going to miss them for the most part. So I, I have this friend who owns restaurants and, and he was trained as a manager at Burger King. He, he thoroughly understands the business side of, of owning a restaurant. So like when he opens a restaurant, they're going to have a much higher rate of success than an athlete, right? Who, who made a bunch of money and wants to open a restaurant as kind of an ego thing. So, so it's, it, you know, these are two, you know, restaurants in general have pretty high failure rates, especially over three or five years. But that rate of failure, like the probability of, of success or failure is going to be dramatically different depending on the person, you know, the financing, the situation. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, this is also inspired by a, an investor. This one, Ben Horowitz of, of the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. Um, he wrote this book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And, and in it, he says something that's really interesting. It kind of points to what you're talking about. He says, it matters not whether your chances are nine in 10 or one in a thousand, your task is the same. And the point being that you have to find a way regardless. So why worry about the chance, the chance you have of getting there? Because, you know, that, that, that's just going to be a distraction. So in the, uh, the pocket guide to action, I use this quote from, from Plutarch that also highlights this point, maybe even in a more badass way. He says, Spartans do not ask how many are the enemy, but where they are. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter how hard the obstacle is, you have to overcome it once you, you, know, you pick a direction. And again, you know, if, if we focus too much on the chances that something might work out or might not work out, then we're not focused on what we need to do to make it happen. So, so to kind of sum this up, in general, we should not use probabilistic thinking to determine what we want to do. But once we choose our direction, we should use probability all we can to help us get there. Gotcha. That makes sense. All right. So going back to this idea of, you mentioned the, the, the guru, what, what, the Indian sage guy. Krishnamurti. Krishnamurti. Is he a guru? I, I, mean, I, I don't know. If I, was, I think he's a guru. Okay, I'll call him a guru. Well, but his whole idea was, you know, trusting your experience over, you know, supposed best practices. Do you think people naturally like to trust their own experience or do they, do they like to go to the comfort of, you know, I'm going to ask for advice or see what, what other people have done? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that's the inclination at all. Actually, um, Krishnamurti has a really, one of my favorite quotes of all time comes from Krishnamurti. And he said, the primary cause of disorder in ourselves is the seeking of reality promised by another. And, you know, primary cause, that's like a, a big claim. And I don't think it's far off. Because you, you, you see this, I, I, I have a lot of experience with this in, you know, I used to help people start e-commerce companies. You know, I, I could tell right away who was going to succeed and who was not. The people who were going to succeed were people who took whatever suggestions we gave them, tried them out, took, his, took a ton of action on it, and found new obstacles or found that, hey, this isn't working for me in this situation. So people that were willing to fail with little pieces 
of information without a complete picture ended up making a ton of progress. People who failed without fail, <laughs> who, who just did not progress, are people that kept coming back week after week wanting a, an entire explanation of, an, of a whole process. You know, tell me how a business works. Well, a business is one of the most like abstract, difficult problems to solve in general. And, and if you're not willing to gain the knowledge that comes with direct experience from that, you're just not, you're not going to make any progress. Nobody can tell you exactly how to do it. People can lay out frameworks. They can, you know, lay out general rules, pitfalls to avoid. But if you're unwilling to actually try to sell something, it's just, it's never going to work. And so, yeah, that's, you, you see this in, in, you know, it's the phenomena of the, the entrepreneur. It's like, there, there's a whole industry serving a group of people who have jobs that are kind of dissatisfied with them or very dissatisfied with them. And they, they don't actually want to take the risk of, of moving on or starting something, but they want to feel like they're making progress. So there's a ton of people offering advice that, you know, may or may not work, but it's not, it's not actually designed to take action on. It's just designed to sell to people who want to feel like they're doing something, like they're, they're becoming self-reliant when in fact they're just, you know, sinking further into stagnation. Yeah. I mean, I've had that same experience. I get a lot of requests, you know, people to pick my brain about, you know, how did, how did you get started with the podcast? how did you grow the art of manliness? And I would give advice to people, you know, pretty much all the time, but then I discovered something you know, I'd follow up with these guys three or six months later. And I was like, hey, how are things going? Did you get started? And like pretty much nine out of 10 of them like had not. They had not taken action. And they were like, oh, you know, I'm still planning. I'm still looking into it. And so yeah, now my policy is, is if someone asks me like, hey, I'm thinking about starting a blog. Can I, you know, take you to lunch for an hour and talk about it? And I was like, look, here's the, how about this? You get started, come back to me six months after you started and come with like specific questions or roadblocks you hit. And I found those like conversations when people take me up on that are much more productive because the advice that I could give them about starting a blog probably wouldn't be very useful because I started mine in 2008 and the whole ecosystem online was different as it is today. Like I got a lot of traffic from delicious.com or whatever, and that does not exist anymore. Right. So like that wouldn't be useful advice. You got to, you, the people have to experience on their own to figure out what works for them and what doesn't work. And maybe go to someone when you come up to a problem, when you've cranked all your widgets and you couldn't find out an answer, then maybe go get some advice. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, part of the, the one, one of the mechanisms that you're, you're using there is actually like tricking folks to get direct experience so that they actually end up trusting themselves a little bit more with the problem. You know, if I, if I make any progress or, or, or can show Brett that I've tried anything, then he'll give me some useful advice. So you're like, you're tricking them into like, oh, wait, I can solve all these problems myself. And then when I come up to a really hard one, Brett could give me you know, specific of how he dealt with similar problems in the past, right? It's probably a different, different technology, but like the shape might be similar. And so at that point, your advice is probably going to be invaluable and fun to give because it'll be used, right? He'll have momentum or she'll have momentum. And yeah, I think, I think, you know, when people ask for too much advice up front, they're robbing themselves of, of that direct experience, which is, is, a much more important teacher than I think anybody else. Yeah. And I, if you're a college student, this also comes in handy because I, I know, I knew a lot of college students who would, or I did this too when I first started, when I was a first, my freshman year, is I would go to the office hours and just sort of just like vomit, like questions all over my teacher and they were overwhelmed and I never, we didn't really make any headway. And they, I think I had finally one professor who's like, here, look, here's what you do. Go back, read this stuff, try to answer all these questions on your own. If you hit a question you cannot answer, then come talk to me. We'll set up an appointment about that specific question. And then from then on, that's kind of, been, that was my strategy going into teacher's appointments during the office hours. Like I had one or two questions. That was it to ask them and everything else I tried to figure out on my that's, own. Yeah, that's, that's awesome that you figured that out early, you know? Yeah. So I think, yeah, advice is just, so confusing if, if you don't have anything to do with it. So the, again, this bias should be not towards seeking advice, but like action first, like going back to the pocket guide to action questions later. 
maybe. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, questions that can be, that are action oriented, right? You know, um, if, if, I, if you're asking a question about a, a starting a business, then you should be ready to take action on the answer you receive very close to immediately, right? And of course, this is, you know, it's, it's different if you're starting a podcast, a blog, or, you know, some kind of lifestyle business where the risk is low, uh, shooting a, a rocket into space. Right, and, right. Don't ask any questions on that. It's, it's, right? it's Just a little do bit it. different. Just develop, make, a, make a launch pad in your backyard. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's bad advice. Right. Yeah. I think as the stakes get higher, you, you might need to get lots of counsel and advice to, to get that going. And then even then, like Elon Musk just kind of proves that that's, it's uh, relative, right? Like, cause as far as rocket builders go, he's asking far fewer questions, doing far fewer calculations than, you know, say the incumbents, but he's also, you know, he's, he's taking huge risks and, and, and making much quicker progress by a lot of measures. Yeah, he's probably, you know, his action is I'm going to hire a consulting company to give me advice on building a rocket, right? Or I'm going to hire this firm to do the le- the legal work, etc. He's not just he he he's taking action, but in a different on a different level. Yeah, yeah. So another practice you talk about is intentional introspection. Uh, what is that, and how do you implement it in your life? Yeah, so I th- I think it's just being aware of the relationship between you and the world. So it's it's noticing when you're aiming at something, you know, because of an external sc- scorecard or an outer scorecard, and you're having a bad time, and you're actually bad at the thing that you're aiming at. So it, on the flip side, it's it's noticing your strengths when you're likely to you know, get into the flow state of that kind of thing. Implementing this is, is just about increasing awareness, you know, and that can be helped along with meditating or journaling. But maybe, maybe another part of implementing this is, is just realizing that you, you don't have to be good at what you think you have to be good at. You can pick a different way and, and you can make something else work, something that you haven't considered yet. Uh, yeah, I like, I like that a lot. And then another point you make, and I think this is the, one of the points of sort of self-reliance that can give people pause, or at least it gives me pause, is this idea of making your own law, right? Becoming a law unto yourself. Because, you know, if, we, if you follow that to that logical conclusion, like that would be very bad, right? Because people say, well, I'm going to steal. I don't think it's wrong to steal because my personal law says it's not. So what's going on there? How, what's the, the nuanced take on making your own law and how do you go about setting your own laws without while not being above you know the shared laws that make civil society possible awesome i'm yeah i'm really glad we get to talk about this so i think to set your own law is just to remain dedicated to what you believe to be right regardless of the opinions of those around you i think it's you know just determining the path you're going to walk down and continuing to walk down it regardless of what's happening around you um and so it's kind of you know respecting those inner contours of your experience so this means paying close attention to your world your experience and i what i don't think it means is you know kind of bootstrapping a whole new system of beliefs or, 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 you know, creating something that's completely anti, anti-social, right? So like there, there's traditions to be bucked. I don't think, I don't think anybody in their right mind can look closely at what gives them meaning in the world and want to do serious harm to others. And and of course, there are people that feel that way. I think, you know, they're psychopaths or extremely misguided. I think they're they're, they're generally people that are not trusting themselves, but trusting somebody who is like mad with power. And of course, that's, you know, a subjective claim. But I think, you know, I, I think it holds up just to how, how I experience the world. So, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not a call for, for being totally psychopathic. <laughs> and, and like we talked about at the beginning of this, this essay, you know, Emerson himself, even though, you know, the, the, the wording and, and self-reliance that the essay is so romantic and, and powerful and, and, and some of that, you know, can, if you just take one quote, it, it could be seen as like, you know, let's throw off all traditions, all propriety and be totally just, you know, forget about anybody else's existence in the world. But I think, you know, if you if you temper this with some of 
uh, Emerson's other essays, especially his essay on manners, we want to be loved as as humans, at least by some people. And the only way to do that is by acting in a way that's lovely, as as Adam Smith might say, you know, as as exuding loveliness. So, I think anybody who's honest with themselves about what they they truly want and what's important with themselves in life isn't going to be totally antisocial. Like you don't come to the conclusion that you're going to do harm to humanity and that that's that's how you're going to to get love in in this life. Well, and related to this, you know, making your own laws, this idea I think people get from the essay self-reliance and sort of the transcendental thinking is, uh, you know, making your own values, you know, knowing what you value. But, I, you know, my podcast with Jordan Peterson a couple weeks ago, he made the case that it's impossible to create your own values. He says it's not possible for you to create your own values and those values to give you significant amount of meaning in your life. Do you think that's true or would you quibble with that? Uh, so I think it's mostly true and I would quibble with that I, I, a little bit anyway. So I, I love that. I love that interview and I'm really happy that I get to, to talk about it with you. So I, I, I love, you know, Peterson used in, in that conversation with you as I, as I remember it, I think he, you know, he said, he said that we can't create meaning that, but we can kind of discover and co-create it. I think his wording co-create pa- paired with discovery is, is really potent and useful. So I think this is also a good time to, to bring up that I, I don't think that the self-trust we're aiming for and becoming self-reliant is, is strictly based on our conscious ideas. So I think that it's actually a deep trust in your ability to navigate the world, including society. I think that one of the most effective paths to this self-trust is actually faith in A, kind of capital B, capital O, big other. So for Emerson, that was nature. For Christians, it's God. For more secular f- folks, I think it's possible with a cause, something bigger than oneself or, you know, mythology. So the, the law that you set in serving this other is the law that you're setting for yourself. And these laws are generally shaped by patterns or underlying rules beyond the grasp of consciousness, I think. So, so when we talk about, when it comes to self-reliance, setting your own laws and, and abiding by them, it's usually more of selecting what you find to be most true to yourself. It's not just coming up with it, inventing it, right? So, so I think that we have to set our own laws, but, but it's, it's, it's more about being aware and discerning than it is about like defining and creating values out of thin air. So like, like Peterson said in that interview, it's, it's, it's very difficult to foist meaning on something because it, it tends to either be there or not. So yeah, I think it's, it's more of a process of co-creation, discovery, and discernment. But as a side note, and this is kind of the minor quibble I have with the Peterson piece, is that I, I do believe that we can consciously create meaning, but I think it's a slow, very weak process, and we're much better served by taking advantage of you know, both our instincts, the meaning that's already there, the values that, that we can see within ourselves, and you know, that, 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 that have kind of been developed through thousands of years of, of narrative work by our anf- ancestors. So yeah, in, in some, <laughs> I, I think, you know, yeah, you're going to have a bad time if you think you can just sit down, write on a piece of paper, your values, and th- those, you know, out of, pulling those out of thin air, I think you're, get, you're better served by discovering values and choosing them consciously from your experience in the real world. Yeah, this reminds me a lot of a conversation I had with Matthew Crawford a couple of years ago, a guy who wrote Shop Classes, Soul Craft. But the one really interesting book we talked about was The World Beyond Your Head. And one of the points he made, the cases he made, was that if you really want to become an individual, this is kind of saying what you're saying, you need to submit yourself to what he, he called it tradition, or but it could be something bigger than yourself. And you might think, well, that's kind of weird. That's counterintuitive. How would submitting yourself to tradition allow you to become a unique, independent individual? In his case, was like you, you had to have a framework in order to differentiate yourself. If you're just sort of trying to be different from everything else that's different, like that's hard to do because you don't, you don't have a framework. Okay, what is different? But once you have that framework, you're able to adjust things and make tweaks to it. And you can actually see that this is something new and different. And the example he gave were these organ 
makers, right? They make restore and make classic organs and they use the traditional way and they're very fastidious about that, but they also make innovations, right? They're kind of adding to it and doing little twist. And it's interesting. These guys, he, he thinks that these guys, they have a, a so, more solid sense of self because they've submitted themselves to the, the traditions of, of cla- you know, classical handmade organ making because they can see how they are different because they are submitted to themselves to that tradition. If that, does that make sense? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I think we can see just in the people in your life, at least in mine, when I look around, the people who have, you know, dedicated themselves most thoroughly to either a faith or a cause or an idea, something that they're working desperately towards, you know, I mean, desperately is not a great word, but, you know, intensely focused on. And, and that's something that's beyond themselves. It's not in, in, and that's not just to serve their own ego, but it's beyond their ego. They are way more self-reliant, way more self-trusting, and way more just balanced and centered in the world than anybody who, who whose career is a one giant ego play or someone who is, you know, super dedicated to self-development, right? I mean, you know, these are people that are, you know, if you spend your life just improving yourself, you're going to be way less, way less uh, centered than somebody who's dedicated themselves to, to, to something bigger. So here's a question. Say you start doing these practices and you're, you're striving to take this posture of self-reliance that we've been talking about. How do you know if you're becoming a self-reliant person? Right. Because like with losing weight, you can, like, I'm losing weight. I'm getting stronger because I can add weight to the bar. Like those things are really easy to track. But how do you track whether you're becoming self more self-reliant? So I think one of the biggest tells that you're becoming self-reliant is that you begin to, by default, respect your experience and kind of stop rejecting your life as it is. So you're operating in a way that embodies the understanding of that Emerson quote that envy is ignorance. Imitation is suicide. So you're growing, but not in a way that rejects your current situation. Continue, continuing to course correct, but you know, without remorse about where you've been or, or, or past choices. You're taking advice from others, but only as kind of more data points and decision that you know that you're going to have to make yourself. So th- those, those sort of things. I like that. And, and do you think it's possible to become like a, you know, a self-reliant sage Right, you're, you're perfectly self reliant, or, or are we going to be spending most of our lives trying, you know, failing, succeeding at self reliance? Yeah, I've never found a self reliant sage. I, I, I am very, very far from from that. So I think you know, and every time I've met somebody, this happens. You know, I, I meet somebody, I'm like, oh man, they've got it down. They, you know, they, they, they found it. That guy is perfectly self reliant. That woman is perfectly self reliant. If I get the chance to meet one of these people and talk with them and engage with them over any period of time, I, I've been proven wrong every single time. So with this, this type of thing, I, I always, I really love this, this kind of, it's a quote from Confucius. And he said something, I'm paraphrasing. He said, at, you know, at 15, I started. At 30, I was really getting going. At 40, I had no doubts. And then he keeps going until at 70, he finally met his ideal. He, 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 he kind of peaked at 70. He, he, he reached the, the pinnacle. And, you know, that's if I can make a little bit of progress every decade, I'm going to be super happy about it. But even with that, you know, that, that kind of far out promise of just slow improvement, I, I think I've, you know, I've seen gains just in the last decade show up fairly, fairly quickly. You know, I think, I think the returns are, are really fast, especially in, in talking about some of the specific things we discussed earlier. I think, yeah, the ben- benefits can come, can come pretty quick. And then you just realize you keep hitting, hitting walls and, and getting thrown off center. And yeah, I think, I think it's more about the progress than destination for sure. Right. Keep the score takes care of itself. Amen. Yeah. Well, hey, Kyle, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work in general? Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, thanks again for having me, Brett. I, I know I say this every time and it might be getting old, but I think it's really incredible what you and Kate have created. And I'm, I'm just really honored to be associated with it in any way. So thank you. Well, no, thank you. The best regular writing that I do is in my newsletter that goes out most Sundays, not all. And you can get that at kyleshin.com slash letter. So it's K-Y-L-E 
S-C-H-E-N.com slash letter. And I dig into my favorite ideas that I found that week there. I know at least Kate reads and, and likes these every once in a while. I do too. I, I read them every time I get them. They're fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a super high compliment for me because I know your inbox is, is just incredibly bombarded. So that's super cool. And I, I, I also like how it's not every Sunday because it's always a surprise. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that's that's actually, that's great for the, like the dopamines, like the slot machine effect going on. It's like, am I going to get it this week? And it, it's great. So and I, I believe it's, it's because of that, because of your advice. So, so thank you. It makes it more fun for me as well. You know, in general, my, my best kind of irregular writing goes straight to you guys at the Art of Manliness. So everybody's already in the right place to get that. Fantastic. Kyle Eschenroder, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. My guest today was Kyle Eschenroder. He's the author of the book, The Pocket Guide to Self-Reliance. It's available at store.artofmanliness.com. Also check out Kyle's website at kyleeschen.com and check out our show notes at aom.is slash self-reliance where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.